So awesome. Well, we love you. Thank you so much for coming. We got a lot more to go still tonight. Um, a few things, and that is, first of all, um, I just want to uh, encourage you. There are many of you guys that um, you were inspired today, even as you listened to Jimmy and Asher and Dawson, and, um, and they talked about prayer so much. And um, Dawson started when he was 15, um, just calling for young people to start prayer meetings. And uh, we call it Bold 100. He started a ministry called Bold 100, which is a band of 100 kids that are committed to leading a prayer meeting. And if you'll go and look on the Bold app, uh, there's a place right there. If you just go download the Bold app and then it says Bold 100. And I wanna encourage you, if you wanna stay connected, right now there's 60 young people uh, that have committed to lead prayer meetings. If you wanna be one of those, uh, the aim and the dream is 100. I'd love for you to go ahead and download that app. It is... You have my permission to be on the Bold app doing Bold 100, but not Instagram while I preach tonight. But if you're doing that, it's fine to jump on there. Also, um, I just want to encourage you. Uh, we're, uh, this fall, we're setting out and we're, we're developing some tours across the country where we're going to do Bold Nights on Wednesday nights. And so there's some of you that have talked to us, but if you're interested in Jacob Ray and Dawson and the team coming uh, on a Wednesday night, uh, that's happening. And we'd love for you to just let us know, um, contact us, uh, because that's going to be really fun. We're going to do bold nights across the country where we've got young people jumping in vans, coming together at a local church, night of worship and prayer, just to cry out to God for revival in your area. And so that's happening. And um, if you can be in touch with us, if you want that to come to your city. All right. Since the video didn't work, that's what she got right there, baby. I, I am your video, baby. Uh, uh, uh. All right. So there it is. I mean, I can't do it quite as good as that one was. You want to be radical. But good to go. but that, that, that's, what it, that's, that's the bottom line of what it was. All right. If you have your Bibles, let's go to Daniel chapter three. If you love Jesus, say I do. You see this poster that's right out in front of you? Just want to pull that out, have that ready. That's where we're going to go tonight. But we're so honored and we're so grateful that you came. And I know that you came from all over. And so um, thank you as you prepare to make your journey back home. Uh, I just want to thank you again for coming all the way to Kansas City. Yes. Daniel chapter 3. And um, it's a famous story. And I, and I think it's one that oftentimes when you think of it, it's easy for you to think of it like a kid's story. It's easy for you to think of it like Veggie Tales. I know when my kids were little, I was teaching them this story and I said to them, we were, there, we were talking about Rack Shack and Benny and I said, can you tell me their real names? Of course, I'm aiming at them saying Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And my daughter Liv said their real names? Uh... Bob, Larry, and Junior. And so um, I know that most of us, that's kind of what we think. And so because of that, it's kind of a narrative in your head that's mostly a children's story. But this is a story about potential martyrs for their faith. This is very different than preaching vegetables. This is very different than something that you heard somebody tell you that you filed in your head as a story for children. And I want to invite you as adults today to hear this story and to apply it to your life based upon the story of bold men that were ready to lose their lives because they were convinced that Yahweh was God. And in Daniel chapter three, there's a story that is, it's, it's mind blowing to look at until you look at the habits and the lifestyle that they lived prior to the moment where they had the opportunity to be bold. And truth be told, many of us will look at a moment like that and we would think, I could never do that. I'm not that kind of person. But if you look at the backstory of who Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were and the lifestyle that they lived before the moment then if you'll develop those patterns that they developed, you too can stand and be bold when you have a moment to either compromise or to stand. 
And in Daniel 3, it's this powerful story because Nebuchadnezzar is suddenly threatened when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will not bow down to this image that he's created of himself. So we'll pick up in verse 13. It says, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God, as he defies God, then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, Boy, there's a lot of theology in that. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. The title of my message tonight is Bold in Babylon. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And fathers, we go as bold into a culture that looks more and more like Babylon. I ask in Jesus' name that you would help each of my friends walk with great boldness. As it said in Acts, that when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they took note that they'd been with Jesus. I pray, Lord Jesus, that each one of these who have been with you over the last three days would leave with boldness. And I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would help them as they face challenges, a culture that's gonna want to shut down boldness, mock boldness, mock their God, mock their faith. And I pray that like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they would stand and not bow. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I was uh, driving about two weeks ago out here um, on one of these roads not far from here and I had uh, my four children and my bride in the car and And uh, all of a sudden, uh, a guy who's trying to turn right, he jumps in front of me and right on his bumper sticker, right in front of me is, is a bumper sticker that was, it was so gross, it was so obscene that I became shocked at first and then angered and then I just wanted to protect my children from reading it. Of course, when you're in traffic, I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, run into him. I thought about it, but I didn't. <laughs> I couldn't go left because there's a car. We had a red light. I couldn't go right. There's a car behind me, so I couldn't go back. I was stuck. So I'm stuck, and I'm, I'm hoping that there's no chance that my kids are going to look up and see the bumper sticker in front of me. And I don't know. I mean, I've seen my fair share of bumper stickers, but this one was just so immoral and so disgusting that just reading it grieved me in a, in a way that worse than anyone I've ever seen. And so in that moment though, here's what I felt. I felt this desire to protect them, but there was actually, there was, there was, there was no way that I could protect them. The only thing that I could do as a father is to help them develop convictions that are so strong in the culture that what's in the culture doesn't rock them. I have to work on what's on the inside because I can't control what's on the outside. And so my aim as a father is to work on what's on the inside, what's going on so that they can be a light to the culture because the culture is something that I can't control. And that's how I feel about you right now. I mean, I listen to the stories of Jimmy telling how God healed him. And I think about you possibly going back and hearing the criticism from other people and your temptation to believe maybe it's not true. I 
I hear the stories of young people talking about what God does in prayer. And I know the way that the culture talks about people that believe that your prayers actually make a measurable impact in the culture. And I know the mockery that comes from the culture of people that believe that your prayers actually make a difference. I hear the story of kids saying, I'm going to spend time with Jesus. I've spent time with Jesus and here's what it's done for me. And I know you live in a culture, you're headed back into a culture that will not applaud you living with passion and intercession and consecration and mission. They will not only mock you, but they will try to transform you and change you into their image instead of into God's image. And so the thing that I feel for you is this desire to to help you walk out of here with convictions that are so strong that you can walk back into a corrupt, like Babylon, culture. When you look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had, been taken, they had taken out of where they had grown up and what they were familiar with. And they were taken into Babylon. And they were taken into a place that did not honor God. And they had to figure out how to live according to God's laws and according to Yahweh instead of living like the culture. And one of the sadnesses that I have, I've watched so many young people that in a moment like this made a bold commitment, even believed the testimonies, sang the songs, even took notes. And then over time, the culture crept into their heart and they ceased to stand. Instead, they decided to bow. And you don't have a 90 foot image of Nebuchadnezzar down <laughs> at a park near your house with people telling you to bow down to a 90 foot image. But you have a culture that wants you to have disordered loves and have anything but first love for God. And the temptation over the next decade will be strong for you to bow down to the values of the culture instead of to the God that you're committed to. I was thinking about these three men and you can imagine when all of those different instruments are played and a whole sea of people bow down like they're supposed to. There's people that they're told, worship this image. And of course they do it. It's what they're told to do. It's what everybody's doing. And imagine... Let's just say that you're actually friends with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And you're bowing down when the lyre and the zither and the harp and the flute are all played. And you look up and you see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are standing while you're bowing. And you know what takes place to people that refuse to bow down to the golden image. You start to look at them and say, are you crazy? Guys, what are you doing? Guys, what is wrong with you? Shadrach, Meshach, Bendigo. Guys. And, and, and the audacity of three men to stand when everybody else is bowing. It's what makes this narrative so easy to understand. It's so clear that here are three that have these core convictions that they would have had these since they were boys. They would have read the Ten Commandments and they would have known, number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Top of the Ten Commandment list. Number two, do not bow down to a graven image. And so they know deep inside of them the conviction. This is what it means to follow Yahweh. What it means is we will have no other gods and we will not bow. Yeah. And yet they found themselves in the moment where everybody was bowing to an image that was not Yahweh. And like a father that wants to protect his kids, I want to tell you, you're headed into a culture. And that culture does not want you to stand, they want you to bow and worship their gods. 
They will try to get the affection of your heart. It will not be an image. But the war of the ages is over the affection of the human heart. It's not over who will possess the land. It's not over who will possess the money. There's fights over those things, but there's a bigger battle going on than who will be wealthy and who will have power. The battle of the ages is a spiritual battle. And it's the love and the loyalty of the people. Will it belong to God who created you, who loves you, who designed you, who knows you, who wants what's best for you, who cares for you? Or will you give yourself your affection, your worship, your awe, your marvel to anything else? And everybody worships. The question is not if they worship, it's what do they worship? And as you leave here, I look at some of you that I see with tears. And this is precious because God's doing something that's so special. And then I'm just old enough. I've just, I've done this every summer since 1995. And I've just watched so many. That when they were here, they thought, surely I'm the one that'll stand. But kind of like Katie said a minute ago, it's easy over time to just slowly allow yourself to get into a place where I'm not sure if I believe. And I guess I'll just, I'll just join the crowd and I'll bow. I'll it's, it's, it's too extreme. Jimmy's extreme. Asher's extreme. Preach on TikTok, crazy. Hold up my shoes and go to another nation. I don't know. It's just some kind of religious crazy people and it's, it's all on a stage and it's probably not real. And, and I'm not saying that cynically. I'm saying that as things I've heard over the years of people that once had tears at the worship song that actually sang, I am free, God's delivered me, let's go. And then years later they said, I think I'll just go ahead and bow to the gods of the age. My dream for you is in these precious minutes is if God would grip you, if you would develop a relationship with God that the convictions inside of you are so much stronger than the culture around you. And you're able to follow, though you go back into a world that's corrupt. When you look at this story, Babylon wants to rename them, wants to change their identity. In verse six, in Daniel one, we read, among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, that was their names. The chief official gave them new names, new names to Daniel, the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. So here's the chief in Babylon and he says, I know how to mess them up. Here's how we'll start. We'll confuse their identity and we'll rename them. So they once had names that sounded like God. Hananiah meant Yahweh is gracious in Hebrew. That was his name. But in Babylon, they changed it to Shadrach, which means I am under the command of Aku, false God. Here's another young man. His name's Mishael. Here's what his name means. Who is like Yahweh? Sounds like worship, doesn't it? Who is like our God? Who is like Yahweh? Sounds like adoration. Sounds like holy, holy. Sounds like God is awesome. Imagine a name like that. We'll change it to Meshach, which means no one is like a coup, false god. Azariah, Yahweh is my helper. Imagine, that's your name. Connected. I am named based upon a relationship with God. He's my helper. 
changed that name to Abednego, which is, no, I'm the servant of Nagel, false god. So in Babylon, a strategy is to take the young people and rename them. Get them confused on their identity. And you're gonna leave here and this whole weekend has been about your identity. It's those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. It's that you are sons and you are daughters. And yet the culture is gonna to try to get songs in your head that cause you to wonder, who am I? The culture is gonna to try to rename you. And really, anything other than there is no God other than Yahweh inside of you. They'll try to get you to, to look inside yourself. They'll try to get you to believe what others say about you. They'll try to turn you into someone who purchases a product. Any way to confuse you. However, you are made by God in his image. Psalm 139 says that God created you in your mother's womb. He knows you. You are not an accident. You were created by God. He has a plan for your life. If you are a young man and you have been redeemed by God, you are a man of God. You are not a woman, you are a man. If you are born a woman of God and you have given your life to Jesus, you are a woman of God. You are not a man. You are a woman of God. You are not a cat. You're made for relationship. And if you don't believe that God really cares, and if you don't believe that you're really made in his image, then anybody trying to sell any philosophy will cause you to question your identity. And you'll end up in a broken place. Do not let the culture rename you. You're made by God. Listen to this response. Because Babylon demands your worship. When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image of God, very good. But if you do not worship it, you'll be thrown into the furnace. It's interesting because Nebuchadnezzar knows these boys. And it's actually not that they worshiped God that caused them the pain. It was the moment that they refused to bow to other gods. So basically in that culture it was polytheism is okay. Polytheism means multiple gods. Hey, you worship Yahweh on your own time, but when it's time to worship this image, you worship it too. And anybody else that does that, they're okay. But here's where the tension came. If you refuse to bow and you say there's only one God, then the rage of Nebuchadnezzar comes towards you. And your culture has no problem with you going to church on a Sunday and acting just like them. Polytheism is tolerated in American culture. Hey, you can say you're saved, redeemed, blood bought, spirit filled, the Holy Ghost. I don't care, because you know what? You love all the things that I love. You care about your image just like I do. You care about fame. You care about money. You actually go and you, you worship all the same idols that I do with every music, every sport, every kind of indulgence. And so say what you want, that's fine with me. But the moment that you stand and say, I will not bow, you'll watch because the culture will turn on you with rage like Nebuchadnezzar turned on them. And most people can't handle the pain. It's too much. But the invitation from your God far surpasses the invitation from anything in the culture, anything that it can offer. And if you'll stand when everybody else bows, 
in the same way that they experienced a miracle, you'll be surprised the way that your satisfaction in God will start to develop and you will start to live a supernatural life and you'll go, wow, I actually can stand in a culture that bows because I'm known, favored, loved, delighted in, have a destiny. And here they are. And they've got, they've got a future. And, and, and that's the crazy thing about this response. I, I, I mean, I'm blown away. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, our God, he's able to save and he will deliver us. So you can feel that faith. But then they say, but even if he doesn't, I mean, I wonder if like first century Polycarp, who was martyred for his faith, I wonder if he had that. I think sometimes we'll, I'll, I'll step out and I'll have a bold moment where I refuse to bow as long as God comes through and gives me the American dream at the last minute. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they could have been martyred. And James, Acts 12, he lost. He, he, he was martyred. Paul was persecuted. It could be possible that you leave here and that you stand instead of bow and you actually are persecuted. And the joy of Christianity is that you actually consider that all joy. That you actually go, that's what I signed up for. In Babylon then, Nebuchadnezzar says, you won't bow, throw them in the furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar wants to destroy them. And if you refuse to bow, I just want to tell you, you're picking a cultural fight and they will come after you. The culture wants you to bow to the images that they bow to. They'll hate you. They'll cancel you. They'll disregard you. They will mock you. And I'm telling you this not because I'm mean, because I'm your friend. And because I'm I'm just, I'm so sad when I see so many. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for an inspirational story and I'm so grateful for a powerful song. And I'm so grateful for an environment like this where everybody's cheering you on. But we do you a disservice if we don't tell you that when you walk out of here, you're headed back into Babylon. And it's hard to be bold in Babylon. It's easy to be bold down here where we're like, and Jacob Ray's kicking up his legs. Right? This is the place. The privilege and the opportunity for you to demonstrate that God has done a work in your heart is not what takes place in this room. In fact, the people that will be most benefited by virtue of Bold Conference did not participate in Bold Conference this week. They're the people that you're going to touch out there. So my dream for you is that you would not leave bold with yourself in mind but that you would leave bold, having gone on a spiritual journey, ready to go and be a bold witness out there. That you would leave here with a vision that says, I will not bow. And the crazy thing about this story, listen to this. I mean, this gets a little bit graphic, but listen to the future ministry of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I mean, they stand and listen to the people that are affected. Look at verse 28 of Daniel 3. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, this is after, after they're thrown into the furnace, And they don't die. Fourth man in the fire. Most of you know the song. Let's get the lifestyle. Listen to what it says. Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I decree the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble for no other God can save in this way. I know that's, that guy hasn't gone through like freedom small group yet. He's just, he's a king that just, but I want you to just see how they stood for their God. And all of a sudden the honor of God is lifted up in the land. And I'm just telling you, 
The great demonstration about God did something in my life is not the way that you retell the story of what God did at Bold Conference. It's how you live when you leave Bold Conference. It's that the convictions are so inside of you that you walk out of here and that you don't bow. But they're going to come after you. It's really real. And it's really, it's really heartbreaking to see someone that at one moment said, let's go. I'm all in. I run to the front. I raise my hand. I bow down. I sing the song, whatever it is. But I'm aiming tonight, not at your response tonight. I'm aiming at June 2032, a decade from now. I'm, I'm aiming at these, you, you being warned, that this is coming. So what, what, what did it look like in the lives of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego where they were able to stand? There's so many things. I just want to give you a few. The first one is this. When we read their story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, they prayed together. It's part of what they did. Just kind of a fun, quick story in Daniel 2. Let me just read it. Their lives are threatened, and then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends. Hold on to that word, friends. His friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And he urged them to plead for mercy from God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. I just want you to see this. Here's a band of friends that pray together. And this group of friends have mysteries revealed. This group of friends end up having the courage to not bow down when threatened with martyrdom and being thrown into a into a furnace and yet they refuse to bow down and we see that they would gather and pray. And I want to invite you to take seriously the idea, not an inspirational few, but to actually leave here and have a plan that you will gather together with a few to pray. That it's going to be your story, whether you lead it or whether you join it, you, if you live in Babylon, you will slowly love what Babylon loves unless you consistently come before God. And when you're in the place of prayer, that's where God downloads his heart into your heart. And those intercessors, those intercessors start to connect with what's in God's heart. And if you live disconnected from it, it's, it's just the way that over time you start to care about what the rest of the world cares about. And so I want to invite you to do what they did. Get close to God. Intercessors become friends of God. Actually, when you look at the Old Testament, it's pretty amazing. People that just stood in intercession actually become the ones that are end up being called the friends of God. Moses or Abraham, they were the ones that were guys that would stand in intercession and ask God. And then they became friends of God. You, even when you just gather with your friends and you just start to pray, intercession leads to intimacy. And you'll be surprised. Thank you, Joe. I love you, brother. Come on, man. Let's give it a hand for Joe. Yes. Uh, thank you, my brother. Second one is this, just real simple. I just want you to see that they actually have each other. They actually have friends. And I want to encourage you to fight for this. Here's what most of you do. I'm not being mean. I've just watched it. Oh, I don't have the friends. So... So you slowly develop and, and run with friends that have other values, love other things. Jesus, he didn't find disciples, he made disciples. Set yourself on fire and develop friendships. Help other people that slowly value what you value. And gather with them, care about it. It's not a, don't have a casual approach. Don't have a, don't, don't think, maybe I'll have the friends or maybe I won't. No, be intentional about that's why when it comes to the youth gathering or when it comes to your small groups, fight for it. Yeah. Gather around friends, fight for it. That's what, one of the things I love about the story is that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had one another when they stood. And I'll just tell you this as a pastor. I just have watched so many that when they've got the friendships, A.W. Tozer calls it the fellowship of the burning heart. We had um, um, Dawson told you the story about praying every night for my dad's healing. 
And so for 25 nights, uh, my family prayed over Zoom during the pandemic, asking God to heal my dad. And on the last day after God had healed my dad, and so we were celebrating. We didn't need the Zoom calls anymore because God had healed him. But my sister-in-law, she just said a phrase that I just loved. She goes, guys, I feel like I've been to war with you. I've never felt so close. What we did mattered. I wish that we just keep on going. Here's what happens. When you gather together with some of those peers, some of those friends and pray, there's a greater delight and joy than just gathering around a hobby. I mean, gathering around for a sport, gathering around for a game, gathering around for a hobby, gathering around to go shopping. Those don't compare to gathering together with a few friends and knowing that your prayers are making a measurable difference in eternity. And I wanna invite you, when you gather with friends that have God at the center, it gives you strength. And in these formative years, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, these are the years where the whole culture is in attack, trying to get you to value what they value. And it's the years that you're just forming and growing and starting to try to figure out who you are. These are years that friends are so important. So if there's a youth meeting on Wednesday night, don't allow sports to be the reason you stop going to church. I know, I know. Listen, I've, I've been doing this so long. I had so many parents mad at me. I mean, I just, I just don't care anymore. I know that's what happens when you get old. You just stop caring because it used to be that people would stop and say, no, 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 David. No, no, no. I just, and, and at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I saw the kids that gave up hobby, materialism, sport, and put God first. And they ended up actually influencing their parents that love the American dream so much that they were actually trying to get their kids to value both. I'm not telling you what to do specifically. You can go ask God, but I'll tell you this. I've seen a lot more young people make it through their teen years when they gave themselves to prayer than when they gave themselves to hobby or sport. So you figure out how it works in your life. And I know you'll call me legalistic. I want to invite you. You ask God what God asks you and you honestly obey God. And you'll be surprised how often God will call you to gather. It's what Leonard Ravenhill says. This is what the Dawson's quote. Gather with a few Six, half a dozen. We don't even say half a dozen, but I guess they did in the 70s. A few, a half a dozen people and groan, cry out to God. And you'll watch your heart get connected to God's heart. I'm telling you that prayer life and those friendships. And then here's what will happen. You step into those things and bold prayer, bold friends, you'll end up with an opportunity to step out in bold faith. It's, it's the way that it always works. You, you start to get God's heart, you get some people around you, and then there will be an opportunity. There'll, there'll be a moment. There'll be a moment where you'll decide, because it's, it's like a setup. Just like these guys had a moment. All of a sudden, the way that the culture worked, everybody bows, except we don't bow. No, we know the 10 commandments. We worship Yahweh. We do not bow to any other God. And now there's the moment to walk by faith, to show bold faith. If you, will, if you will walk in prayer and you will gather with friends and pray, you will be surprised. There always comes the moment where you get to exercise your bold faith. It looks different in different towns. It looks different in different schools. It looks different with different families. But you get that and there will be a moment where you will choose, I will not compromise. And I'm telling you, that's actually your glorious moment. You will have a moment that says, I refuse to bow. And that's the moment that when you get that, when you get that, that moment where you refuse to bow, I mean, in your pocket, like on your resume, where it forms some identity inside of you, you will start to see yourself as 
a bold follower of Jesus. And you get some of those moments where that starts to form you. I am made by God. I'm made in his, in his image. I have relationship with him. I spend time in prayer with him. I develop friendships with other people that are like-hearted. And now because I have a different value system, now life itself, the culture comes, stands against me. I have an opportunity to stand and I refuse to bow and everybody laughed or mocked, but I stood for God. And then you'll start to say, that's actually who I am you'll actually start to develop this confidence or this boldness and you will watch yourself step out of timid Christianity into bold Christianity. Timid Christianity is boring. It floods the culture. But bold Christianity is worth dying for. Bold Christianity gives you something to live for. Gives you something that impacts eternity. And so just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had a moment where they stood in bold faith. And they stepped out. I want to just invite you to step out. I want to invite you to decide. I will not bow. I have decided. At the end of the day, you will either bow to the gods of the age or you will stand. I remember when I was in high school, uh, my favorite, my favorite, uh, we had CDs. I don't know how to explain what those are, but um, <laughs> there was one by Keith Green and it was a song called No Compromise. There was a poster that said No Compromise. And um, when I was 16, uh, I was average teenager, braces, mullet, it's Oklahoma, and uh, early 90s, and, and I just remember taking this poster that said no compromise, it was this picture of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and uh, I posted it at my school and uh, kept it up for two years, and in my school, there was a place that I had that part of the, it was a, hard to explain, but it was a, this wall where I could post whatever I wanted. And it was a, it was a I, I went to school about 2,600 kids. When they'd walk through, there was a place where I didn't put up the pictures <laughs> with friends and all the other things. I just put up <clears throat> poster. No compromise, because I knew me. I knew my temptation and I wanted to have a resolve in my heart as I went into my junior year. I said, pre-decision decision, I will not bow. And tonight I want to ask you as you leave, make a pre-decision decision. Know that Babylon is out those doors. Know that as you go back, you will face a culture that will surely play the harp and the lither and the zire and this whatever else it is. And it, when the music plays, the moment comes, you will be tempted to bow. Yet there is eternal reward, eternal delight, eternal opportunity, and ministry that impacts people's destinies based upon you saying, I will not bow. No compromise. I want to invite you if you'll take the next decade. I'm convinced if you'll take the next decade, you'll form habits that will impact the rest of your life. But if you'll take the next decade and say, I will not bow. No compromise. I'll stand like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I want to invite you, don't come down here to the front, but wherever you're at, just stand to your feet wherever you are.
if this is true, and this is just not a moment that you're doing because others around you are doing it, but if this is real, and you refuse to bow in Babylon for a decade, then this room will make a measurable impact in the globe. So I want to invite you, sobriety, not, listen, I, I'm not the kind of person that pities you because you're in puberty. I'm not the kind of person that thinks, let's make it easy. Let's fill their lives with hobbies. Let's just pad their lives. I've seen too many 13-year-olds ablaze. I've seen too many 15-year-olds know who they are and actually use these years to change their school, their world. And so my prayer for you is that you would not buy into the cultural narrative that these are the years to waste, these are the years to be comfortable, these are the years to play, these are not the years to play. Turn these into the years that you pray, turn these into the years that you ask God what he wants. God, here are your sons and your daughters. The ones that you delight in, the ones that you love, the ones that you created, the ones that you made, the ones that before they were even born, you knew them. The ones that you knit together in their mother's womb, the ones that you have a destiny for, the ones that you sent your son to die on a cross because you care about their eternal salvation, the ones that you want to spend eternity with. And God, I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would protect them. Yes. I pray that you would strengthen them. And as they stand and refuse to bow, yes. I ask, Lord, no compromise. Yes. Yes, Lord. Yes. No compromise in us, yes, God. Lord. Yes. Yes, Lord. And I ask, Lord Jesus, that even like we read the story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I pray, Lord, that they would reach thousands and thousands of people. Yes with the good news of the gospel. If you want to pick up this poster that's right at your seat, there's enough for everybody. You should have a pen. I'd like this to be kind of a holy moment. We're going to give you this poster invite you to sign it. And here's the idea. When I was uh, 23, I visited Hernhut, Germany and read about a man who impacted the globe by a commitment that he made. He called it a vow, but he was a teenager and he made a commitment with some friends. His name is Count Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf. Dawson talked about him earlier. What, it's interesting to hear my son tell a story about Zinzendorf and say that you're inspired by him. The good news for you is that I asked Renata if we could name you Zinzendorf. She said no. We settled on Dawson. But he gathered with some friends and they took a vow. And they just did it with each other. And so I know, there's a, there's a part of me that doesn't like the word vow because I know it feels really strong. But it's not my word. It's a word from 1719 or so. So we're just going to use it, redeem it. And the reason why I don't like the word vow is because I don't want it to feel um, painful, legalistic painful. But I do want you to aim for a goal. And I do know that when you develop the habits and you form the right habits, those habits then form you. And if you'll spend time with God and do the, th the four things, passion, spending time with God, 
intercession, gathering with a few friends to pray, consecration, setting your life apart to be holy to Lord's mission, caring about other people coming to Christ. If you'll develop those in your teen years, then by the time you turn 20, you'll watch and the values of Jesus, what's in his heart, will take up a lot of affectionate real estate in your heart. And so this is, for us, it's a sober moment. And I wanna read this to you and I wanna invite you. If you want to sign this, you can. Some people sign it, that's why we gave you a pen. Some people just post it in the room. Uh, Preston, are you in here? Preston Coles, you still here? Hey, Preston, did you ever hang this in your room? How many years? Seven or eight years in your room. How old are you now? 28. That's awesome. Let's be like Preston. That's the goal. Let me read it to you. It says this. Passion. Jesus has a real undeniable love for me. As I grow in revelation of his love for me, my love for him grows. He's my savior, my friend, my healer, my king. I am to personally read God's word and worship him daily. Intercession. My prayers move the heart of God. Jesus set the example of being intentional, not only in devotional prayer, but prayer for those around me. I believe that when I pray, God hears and he moves on my behalf. I vow to engage in intercessory prayer daily and join or start a weekly prayer meeting. It's a big, big commitment. Consecration. Jesus tells us that the pure in heart will see God. I vow to daily make choices to set myself apart from the things that move my focus from Jesus and his word. I'm going to live a consecrated lifestyle by fasting from something one day per week, as well as an expression of my wholehearted love for Jesus more than the things of this world. This gives me increased times to pray and sit in Jesus' presence. Last one is mission. Jesus' final words while on the earth were to go out into the world and make disciples. As I pursue being like Jesus, it is my aim to effectively communicate his gospel into every conversation, text, and action. Ooh, this has been updated. Got a text? Did you? Kenny, did you update this? We didn't have text in 2005 when I wrote this. Huh? Jacob? Yeah. What's up? All right. All right. <laughs> Preston, yours didn't say text. <laughs> Why does it say TikTok? No, I'm just kidding. I vow to commit my time, energy, and resources to intentionally engage, engage. And there's a blank for you to ask the Lord for a number of people with the gospel in the next year. So what that means is how many people I want to tell about Jesus this year. I sense the Lord leading me to. And then there's a place right there. That big line is a place where you can sign it. And then you can take this. Just take a moment. And I want to invite you. You can be seated. Sometimes kids like to like lay on the floor. Just get with God for a moment. And when you're ready, if you want to sign that commitment, that vow, sign it. Oh, 
heaven to learn. Jesus, we are so grateful that you have changed us and transformed us. And the good news of your coming, your life, your death on the cross, your burial, your resurrection, your ascension, sending the Holy Spirit to live in us and empower us and be near us is the narrative of our lives. And we today take this as a holy moment to just sign up again. Give your lives. Father, I pray for my friends. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help them to be bold in a culture that looks so much like Babylon. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would strengthen them with might in their inner man. I pray for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the days to come. I pray, Lord Jesus, that they would love to be with you in the secret place. I pray for prayer meetings all across the United States. I pray for lives of fasting and consecration and holiness. I pray that they would lead their friends to Jesus and have stories of God at work in their midst. And I pray that they would walk with faith when they're persecuted or mocked or ridiculed. Strengthen them, I pray. Touch them, I pray. Fill them with power. We love you. And Bold Conference said,